shoulder got to the yeah. side. Look at that thing, man. Like that to me looks like a PB. What do you think? That's going over five. <laughs> nah, it's not five, but holy crap. Dude. Damn right. <sighs> That's a four. Dude. Four pounds right after that. Here we go. Oh my god. <laughs> Dude. Look at that. I have big hands. <laughs> that thing's huge. Girthy. That's triple C thick. We're calling them today, boys. What's going on, buddy? Open this thing up, but be sure I got it all set up just right. Well, the camera's a little more biased towards me. Whatever, that's fine. <laughs> we fix later. Uh, I need to post to the socials. Got one more to do. Hello, done. Link. Oh, there it is. It's like, how dare you? Oh, I don't know. Right? Because I'm all fancy on there now. That's cool. That's cool. There it is. Chris, what's going on, buddy? Glad you like the intro. I love that intro. The thing fires me up every time I see it. Hey, David. How you doing, buddy? <clears throat> How is everyone on this wonderful? And that's... We're both Mr. PB to you there, Brian. <laughs> Not just him. Hi. <laughs> because this was better. I, dude, I laughed so hard at my stupid self the other day. When you when you posted your new profile picture of your bigger fish, like stop one upping me, jerk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw that. I, I laughed. Ah, uh, I had a I had a real good laugh about that. <laughs> I'm dumb and I like to laugh at myself. Ah, <laughs> uh, hey David. Uh, I got to let dog up. We'll be right back. All right, Keith, get to it. Don't waste time. Don't waste our time. Get to it. Hey, everybody in here is already dropping likes in the stream. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Always helpful. Always appreciative. Appreciated. We are appreciative. Appreciative. Produce. And as such, it is appreciated. Remix. <laughs> Bring you, chat. <laughs> Haven't seen you in a few weeks. Damn, you are ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where the hell has he been? Huh? Yeah. I. <clears throat> he had changes... And as such, he no, was no longer around to be able to on Wednesday nights, which is funny because he was like, you need to change away from Thursday to Wednesday. So that means football. I'm like, all right. <laughs> I didn't change it just for him. Change it for everybody. A lot of people were like, yeah, Wednesday's better. And honestly, it's better for us too. Yeah, it so, is. And football's dumb. Yeah, for the most part. <laughs> that's, just, that's just me saying that because I don't watch sports. No. Yay, sports. <laughs> Yay, hit the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, TV18, what's up? Ah, oh, sound muffled. Come on. Is it really? Is it just you or is it everybody? There's no changes to anything. So I really hope that it's not actually this because that will infuriate me. There's nothing I can do to fix that on the fly, I don't think. And is it just me or is it Andrew too? Happy holidays, guys. Okay, well, nobody answered, so. Thanks, David. Happy holidays to you as well, sir. Okay. Sounds good to me. Panda, it's just you again. Sounds good here. Yeah. Panda, take <laughs> your speakers out of the water. <laughs> Sounds perfect. Yes. Good. You had me freaked out for a second there. There's always something going wrong. Yep, there's the wife. You sound good to me. Thank you, wife. Thanks, his wife. <laughs> uh, we'll, uh, we'll go, like, not even 30 more seconds, and we'll roll into it. We have... A lot and yet a little to discuss. This probably won't be as long of a show as we typically do, which is like usually around two hours. Probably be able to keep this to maybe like an hour and a half or less, uh, which would be good because there's no need to overdo it. 
but I want to make sure we have plenty of time to elaborate. More importantly, I want to be plenty of time that we can answer any and all questions that people have for us. I want to be able to elaborate not just from our perspective, but also on any perspective of anybody else as we dive into this. Maybe speak closer, Sean. I thought it was to speak Panda, closer to Sean. Person. I was going to be like, hi, how are you? I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Panda, the only one. I don't know what we're going to tell you. Your phone's broken. Fix it. <laughs> um, where, where are you in Cali? Is he from Cali? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Uh, he actually, he lives near a couple of bass factories. He was just telling me one of his, his clear lake. No, no, no. <laughs> other way. Um, one of his bass factories now has Lund boats. You can rent out for the day for like pretty cheap. That's pretty well, sick. I mean, relatively speaking, right. For a brand new freaking boat. I'm hearing things. It's fine. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks David. Ah, all right. Let's get into it. So first and foremost, again, thank you everybody who's watching. Appreciate it as always. If you haven't done it yet, just drop a quick like on the stream. It helps immensely. For donations, I didn't update it because I forgot how much was donated last week, but I think it was only 20 bucks. I don't remember. I'll have to go back and look. But for those that are donating, thank you so much. Between the donations we received here and donations we received from other sponsors, we are well on our way towards that next milestone. And the other thing I can do is I can finally hire somebody to make a new graphic for Real Northern Bass. Not Real Northern Bass Talk, but Real Northern Bass. That's something I really want to do is kind of steer towards that for a whole host of reasons this isn't going away but real northern bass it just speaks more universally so i kind of want to go with that theme plus that's what this whole show is about right it's real northern bass talk so we had an idea that back here i want to put up a new sign i texted you about that the other day and didn't answer me i thought i did jerk no i swear to god i wrote out like a like a four line freaking i guarantee you if he opens this phone he's gonna look at it and be like huh didn't hit send <laughs> that's probably exactly what happened um so but I, no, I, that got thrown out. Damn it. All right, that's okay. We can make another one. So okay. what I want to do is put up like a nice like backlit board back here and cut out the new logo behind it, backlight it, so you know some like opaque plastic behind it. Some LEDs can change it. I got a plug right here, so it's like super easy to do all this. Oh, yeah. But I, I need want a logo for another Northern Bass to be able to do that. I think that's gonna look fantastic. So I want to um I want to get that done. So, but now we can because we had the funds to do it, and I'll be hyped about it. The other, the plus side to it too is it'll basically be like a slap board. It'll be able to take a bunch of stickers from other companies, throw them up on there too. So, always a good thing. Uh, Mary, how's it going? Bass, Bass and Brian from Amherst New Hampshire says hey to Dennis Hart. Hey, Dennis isn't here, but I will forward the message <laughs> for those that are uh, for. Okay, so more to that. So more to that. Speaking of Dennis and things that are happening and have happened, go check out 603bass.com. Bingo. And you'll see why. <laughs> What's on there? What's the new thing? There's an article. An article from our friend Dennis, Dennis Hart. Hart. So the first official blog post is also a guest blog post from our good buddy Dennis Hart, who is no schlum. The guy has wrote for On the Water magazine, had wrote for On the Water magazine for years. It's a big deal. It's actually a pretty big magazine. Mm. Um, he knows his stuff. He's a very experienced angler. He has been killing it this year. Two eights? I think he's got at least one eight, but I thought he had two. He might it was an two. eight and a seven. That's what it is. I think it was yep. a seven and a half and an 8.1 or something like that. Like, mm -hmm. dude knows his stuff, especially when it comes to cold water, spring, late season. Dude knows his stuff. So he put up a beautifully written article um, on Blade Baits. It's up on the website, 603bass.com. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet and you're interested in more blade bait fishing, Really strongly recommend you go and check that thing out because it is a honestly a great article. We got a, a lot of great feedback, especially from anglers that I know are hammers with blade bait fishing this late in the year. So Dennis killed it with it. He did a really, really good job <clears throat> as I senior editor also did because I had to do editing. <laughs> it was actually, it was great. So I didn't really have to do a ton of work. Um, what do we got here? Aiden, thanks buddy. Talon, what's up? And Donk Swampy. Donk Swampy, I haven't seen you in forever. Yeah, what the hell? You like barely stop in. You can stop by more often. <laughs> uh, and you're very welcome, Mary. And a good article of that. Dave, you did read it. Good. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you, buddy. Hey, Jack. How's it going? Cough. Yes, go down. We're reading it now. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate it. Cough. Hey, great article. Cough. Drink some water. I, Bass and Panda helped immensely with a ton of the final editing there. Just... Basically rephrasing a bunch of different areas for me that didn't read very well. Um, 
he was helping me with like a lot of passive sentences. Like there's a, there's a whole lot of like backend stuff, right? With, with websites in general, not just your SEO, your search engine optimization, but like the readability of it too. Like numbers of words per sentences matter and how many words in a block before you have a subheading heading matter. And <laughs> that emoji is awesome. <laughs> Oh, but it was, it was awesome. It was definitely a team effort. Dennis did like 70 to 80% of the whole document. Um, I threw in the whole thing about the gear and line, like rods and line and stuff. Uh, and I elabor elaborated here and there, but otherwise the entire gist of what Dennis wrote was untouched. And then we just, you know, worked on grammar and structure of it all, which really wasn't that much to do. Badison Panda helped send it home perfectly. So That's I'm really excited idea, Keith. with uh, how it came out. What do you say? So, I don't know about forums because right now the site isn't costing me a whole lot. Yeah, that would. I've done a website before. That would bump it up. In my previous life, <laughs> pre fishing on the interwebs, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually had done a lot of stuff with video gaming. I'm, there's probably some people here that already know this, but for those that don't, I actually had a really successful YouTube channel prior to this. It's still up, actually. Uh, called Shoosty Bang, and it's not spelled anywhere like you might think about it. Uh, it peaked at 10 million views and 52,000 subscribers. Last I saw, last I looked at it was over I a think year ago. Still over 40,000. Yeah, last I saw it was 43,000 plus subscribers still on there. I almost when I started this channel you started, started from there. You did. I didn't. I, I didn't want to. I wanted to start 100 percent from scratch, organic, and see what I could do, and I think it did pretty goddamn good. Yeah. Look at us now. What are you now? Yeah. I'm just here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we had a website back then. To add a forum is like actually kind of a lot of money. And it's not just like a one-time fee. It's a one-time fee plus a monthly fee. So, I don't know about that. It, the website has to get to a certain point of some sort of self-sustainment before I will consider that. However, that being said, you can add comments on any article in there that I've posted so far. There might be some other stuff in there that I need to add the option to add comments, but it's there. So again, 603bass.com. It's in the video description, makes it easier for you. But if you haven't checked it out yet, please do so. For those that read the article, if you enjoyed it, share it. Like that would be hugely helpful. Uh, it's already doing really good. Last I saw, it was like 140 something views. No, 170 something views. Oh, shit, that was yeah, quick. It just like, it, it took off like right off the bat. So it's it's been good. I am excited. Uh, town spent all day in the woods. How'd you do? In a What's woods. going on, Mark? In a woods. In a woods. Who's woods? Ben Bradley. <laughs> Glad I could listen live this week. Work has been a pain in the ass. I haven't been able to last couple weeks. Well, thank you for joining, buddy. Greatly appreciate it. Nice, David. I'm glad that helped out for you, too. Get out to fly down and give you some tips. Yeah. Who yeah. flies down? Al is the owner of BassBulletCentral.com. Really good dude. Uh, Canadian man. And no, I, said he's... Who, I said, who flies down? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John. What's going on, buddy? Does free forms work? I don't know. I'll have to look into it. But we'll, we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. Okay. So we covered... Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to say, too, on the topic of... I guess just like everything as a whole, right? And how you guys have been phenomenal for supporting everything that we do. If you want to do donations, you can either do it right here through YouTube. If you have your account set up as such, or if it's easier, you can donate directly to us through PayPal or Venmo. Both of those accounts are down in the video description below. We don't take a hit from either one of those. YouTube skims like 40% off the top of every donation. So pick your poison. Otherwise, anything that comes our way, like seriously, hugely helpful. Uh, to reiterate again, the next goal is all new GoPros for the boat, uh, which would be hugely helpful. Ooh, Panda actually has a really good point. Or donate baits. Like if you guys got something you want us to review, fish the hell out of, go for it. I actually got some stuff from a guy in, in Connecticut I need to get feedback on. I've been fishing with them a lot. I like them. They're dope. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they're good. They're mm -hmm. really good. So, um, yes, I do take big swim baits as donations. Yeah, I'm, glides. I'm more partial. <laughs> Andrew <laughs> tries not to be too picky, but if you're going to donate something, I guess we can accept the Piz Glide. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there, okay? I know it's like... It doesn't even have to be a Piz. No, it has to be a Piz. <laughs> Why? Because you want it. <laughs> I don't want the Glide. I don't give a shit about I'm the name. I'm terrible at Glides. <laughs> I haven't caught a single Glide fish yet. Piz Glide would be sweet, though. Definitely. It would be really sweet. I do know what he's doing. Um, hey, he's coming to the New England Fishing Expo. Is he? Yes, sir. Sick. Yeah, it's going to be good. Not going to make it. At all? No, to his booth. Oh, no. To buy something? No. no. I, I won't be able to get there that early in the morning. Nope. Forget it. I'm all set. 
Um, I'll look at everybody else's beats <laughs> when they when they when they show me. Oh, this is Piz. Oh, cool, thanks. <laughs> you got to be there like four hours before opening to even have a chance at it. All set. I was talking to him about it. He's not going to bring anywhere near as many baits as oh, really? he'd like. There's no way he can make them that fast or True. that many in that time. Well, so, he did it. He had he killed it last year. 150 baits. He sold out of the first 100. He made like 30 50 in like, grand in like 10 minutes. Yep, just about 10, <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes, and they're all gone. That's how freaking <laughs> it's insane. Uh, all right, let's go into it. So the recap, this is going to be a little different because typically we spend like the first 15, 20 minutes just doing a recap from the last trip. We're going to do it a little bit differently this time in that the whole show is kind of recap, but we want to elaborate on that quite a bit on everything. So real quick, I'll spend like 30 seconds recapping my day solo, the day before Thanksgiving. You spend 30 seconds kind of recapping quickly like... I guess the overall numbers and stuff, right? From our day this past Sunday, just a few, so half a week after I was there solo. Mm-hmm. And then we'll like dive into the minutia. So that way the people that are really just curious, like what was the final result? They didn't see it on social media. They get the answer now. Then we can dive into the details. So Wednesday, I went solo. Day before Thanksgiving, took a gamble, took the day off, panned out amazing. Mm-hmm. First bite of the day, broke off. Fired right back with my second cast uh, to that same spot. And it was my first fish of the day. It was my PB, 5.04 pounds. I actually went back and looked at the footage the other day. And it was, thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> it bounced between 5.02 to 5.1 something. I forget what it was on the high side. And then it settled in at 5.04, took a scale off, turned it off, turned it back on, teared it, weighed it actually hung at 5.1 for a little bit and then settled back in at 5.04 again so 5.04 she is uh, after that that was bottom contact bait at the bottom of a steep bank right against the shoreline tried that for a little bit longer got one rat completely changed up went to Miki rig the rest of the day not at the bottom of the transition but adjacent to it out further this is important because we're going to cover a lot of this later and didn't exactly wreck them at that point. And I wasted three hours of the six total hours I had fishing a spot I never should have even wasted time on. But as soon as I got back off and came back to like, you know, that first chunk in the morning that went well, started hammering them again on that Demiki rig. Hey, hammering, right? I caught seven fish. I had nine total bites. And essentially it was only three hours of effective fishing. So mm. all in all, good day. Water temp at that point was 48 to 49 degrees. I think is what I had said. Something like that. Yeah, because it... It was 47, 46 to 47 when we went back that Sunday. Yeah. So, Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Let's get into the whole thing now. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was fun. <laughs> Sunday, was, Sunday was sick. <laughs> we caught, we caught a lot of fish. Um, they weren't all big. There was, I mean, we did catch a lot of big fish, but mm. we also caught a lot of small fish and pretty much... I don't even know how far into this you want me to go. I mean, like, we were throwing, we were dragging jigs in, in like 45, 40. Yeah, I'd say 40 anywhere, to 45 is the bulk of it. And then I, we, we also. A couple in like 35. Yeah, and then I don't know how big that that last one was and how deep. I mean, I know how big it that was. That one could have been deep. 50 to 55 feet. Yeah. So that's the only one that was. If we, we, we figured we caught between 20 and 25 fish. If we go on the high side and say 25. 20 of those came out of 40 to 45 right. feet. And the other five came out, like, probably three or four of them came out of Shallower. 35, th- maybe even 30, 30 to 35 window. And then, and then the one could have been That one could have been, yeah, a lot deeper. So recap the best five we had for the day. I don't even remember the numbers. Oh, buddy, I remember off the top of my head. You ready for this? Five, two, eight. Yep. Five. <laughs> I don't remember the other one. My my other PB. <laughs> I don't remember it. This guy. Five two. This guy. Yeah. Five eight, two yeah, oh. I didn't remember it. I was gonna say uh, five two eight five four, two oh. four eight five. Four eight six. Four eight six. Yeah, Ken doesn't remember mine. Four... That's why I remember his. <laughs> I remembered yours. I remember it was a four eight something because we were going all over the net all over <laughs> fucking everywhere. <laughs> It was a good day. I don't remember. You have them all written down. Oh, I remember. Oh, so it was yeah, five, your, your 528, a 5.20, by 4.86, which was, I think, the second four plus pounder of the day we caught. Yeah. And then a 4.26. No, sorry. He had a 4.55. And then I had a 4.26. And then we actually called out a 4.06 that I had caught the very first fish of the day. Right. My fish went 406, 4.8. 
0.86 and then the 4.26. It's kind of weird. They're all 0.6. Like yeah. Six at the end. And I caught that largey randomly first cast of the day. Oh, yeah. It was funny. A little what, one and a half pounder. Literally the only large mouth we caught all day. Yeah. Um, it so big. best five. So math is hard. Six fish over four pounds. Four four pounders and two five pounders. Best five went 24.15 pounds. All small mouth. It was pretty awesome. It was sick. Real quick, Carl, glad you could join us. More importantly, Whoa. thank you very, 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 very much for the donation, buddy. Thanks, dude. 50 bucks. That's sick. In the bank. <laughs> that is going to be hugely helpful for all the go the uh, upgrades of the GoPros and some other things as well for the boat as far as like mounting apparatus. I've covered that before in the past. I got most of it done. I still got some more stuff to get done. But anyway, circling back. Yes, Cam. Twas unreal. <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty sick day. I was... Boy, I was done at 10 a.m. <laughs> it's an understatement. <laughs> I was, I don't ever get like that when I'm fishing, and I was not having a good day. <laughs> it's it's funny because it, it literally happened the same thing last year. We were talking about this on the way home. We realized something. Last year, I went out solo, caught my PB. We came back that same weekend, just a few days later, and we killed it. And we put together our best day of smallmouth fishing we ever had. Prior to this past Sunday, we had 23.7 something pounds on our best five. He had a five even, like a four pound, 14 ounce, a four pound, 10 ounce. I had a four and a, a four, half, that a four, four eight, and a quarter. Eight. And I caught my PB even. twice in the same day last year. Same yep. thing. And both days you had absolute mechanical meltdowns with your rods. <laughs> oh, God. I was done. And I was like, you know what? Whatever. I'll retie it. How many times did I retie? I don't even know. Twice. Relined, not retie. Relined twice. <laughs> Real quick, uh, Mary, best Christmas gift for bass fishing? An all expenses paid trip to Lake Baccarat in Mexico. For a, a joking answer, <laughs> for just a mere twenty five hundred dollars for five nights of the best bass fishing in the world. Um, like seriously, just though, to if get you don't, there. <laughs> yeah, just to get there. No, no, that that that's I mean, just no, that's, to be there. Yeah, to, to get there. there. So like nine hundred bucks to fly out of New, you know, New England to get yeah. there. Um. I would say like gift cards are, are really hard to beat. You know, Taco Warehouse, Taco Supply Depot, based out of um, the place there uh, in Connecticut. Ben's Tackle Shack, based in Leicester, Massachusetts. Absolutely great. Their web store still needs some polish. Like they're working on it hard. They have a good amount of stuff available you can buy online. But if not, their actual storefront down in Leicester, Mass, is amazing. So. If you want to go for a trip and at least provide something that like gives him an actual good physical storefront to go to, Ben's Tackle Shack. Absolutely go there. Bam. You cannot Bam. go wrong with gift cards for bass anglers. And he carries Beast Coast. Yes, he does. So, um, And then if not, if you actually want to buy something specific, I'd try and figure out what kind of gear your angler needs, be it rod or reel, like something, something splashing, whatever you can do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Nice tools are always nice too. If you're looking, you know, like something more budget minded, like a really nice pair of scissors, like fishing scissors or pliers, always go a long way. Pliers, scale, net can always go ego, for scale. Ego fishing gear, the S2 slider net, ha, huh, the best net. It floats, telescoping oh, yeah. handle, nice big net, basket for it. It's great. Um, once I wrapped, once I wrapped a seven foot fishing pole from Tackle Shop, I brought it in my own Grand Prix. That was fun. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, let me back it up. I missed it. Wait, 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 wait. I saw the question. Oh, sorry, Cam. Best five went 24.15 pounds. What's going on, Tiago? Glad you can join us, friend. Hey, T. Uh, <laughs> if I can call you that, T. So, let's dive into the minutia of breaks left and right. Chad, I don't know what you mean by that. Breaks left and right. What? Oh, maybe he's saying because I retired twice. I had to reline twice. And I was breaking off left and oh, right. Oh no. no 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 breaks. No, just... that was just a whole bunch User of error. <laughs> bullshit <laughs> and stupid hands not working and <sighs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> it was rough. I was at the point where I almost broke my rod over my knee again. <laughs> I didn't though because that's an expensive rod. But, I, went, I went back and I looked at it. I timed it. So when he was like at his breaking point, and it takes a lot for Andrew to get his breaking point, I looked at him and I was like, 
you know you're just gonna go catch two fives now right because you just went through all that crap and to get everything set up he's like <laughs> <laughs> just didn't even talk just noises right <laughs> so we uh it, it was less than five minutes later you caught that first one your pb your 5.20 <laughs> five minutes between me, me calling it it was awesome i was like we were gonna move spots and i was you know what one more cast right here and i bombed this jig dude as like all the line on my reel this and is I important we're gonna segue from this right into the minutia of right. doing what we do looking for these big fish late in the year so i bombed this thing as far as i possibly could over the spot that we had already been previously working caught a couple fish off of and we were marking fish all over the place i bombed this jig as far as i could with this reel and rod and I let that thing sink, and I, I'm pretty sure I just put my rod down to go do something. I think I might yes, have been did. eating or something. <laughs> but, Wait, really? Are you sure? <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty sure I got something to eat. And then I picked the rod back up. I reeled in. It was probably maybe like a minute I let it sit down there. And I reeled in the slack, and I lifted up, and it just felt spongy. I was like, huh. No, it's still there. So I went to go set the hook. I set the hook, and it just didn't move. And I was like, huh. And then it was like, womp, womp. I was like, oh, <laughs> shit, that's a fucking fish, dude. That was, and uh, yeah, that was that was pretty sick. I don't, I don't, I honestly don't even remember that fish, like, catching it, besides the way that I cast it out, let it sit, and picked it up as it was sitting there. I don't even remember getting it on the boat. Just all blur. Yep. <laughs> I remember everything from the second one, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was... It was nuts watching that. Both fish, it looked like he hooked... Well, not so much the second one. The second one actually didn't quite fight as hard. Like, it did and it didn't. It it came right up out of however deep it was, and it jumped. It didn't really jump. It kind of, like, tail walk, kind of splash, kind of Yeah, like, roll on the side, and, like, as it was trying to, like... Holy over, shit! Dude, <laughs> I saw that thing from a mile off, and I knew exactly what he had. <laughs> yeah, we both fucking screamed when it came out of the water. Was it the first one or the second one you didn't even see? The, sec- the first one, because you're like, oh, man. I don't remember what the hell. I was probably looking at my feet or something. I don't know. You were, and you're like, well, I didn't see it. Oh, like, you're huge. He's like, is it-? I was like, is it really that big? And he's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Jake, we're going to get to that in a second on the weight jig and trailer you fellas use in that deep water. However, I'm not sure we're going to really discuss what We'll tell is. you everything but the trailer. There's a lot of delicate balance Ish, to be had with this. Kinda. We'll, we'll get into it. Um, we worked really hard to figure this one out. But I can tell you right now, Carl, to answer your question, it was not Little Magnum. Little Magnum jig is meant for vegetation, not for open water fishing. That's why Beast Coast has the open water sniper jig, which is phenomenal. Actually, on our last tournament, the Berkshire Bass um, Fall Classic, our day one, we did terrible, but I had a four and a quarter. It's like four point, like a heavy four point two eight two something. I forget what it was, and it was on the open water sniper. Um, yeah, the open water sniper with a special little trailer on it, and it was, dude, things been killing it. Really works well for largemouth, but it has been phenomenal for the smallmouth too. So circling back on your last point there, Andrew, with that big fish, your first big fish after your whole debacle, that was. I think at that point I already had three, four pounders in the boat. I think so too. So, and I had, I think that was my first big fish of the day, honestly, because I had that small largy and I had like, I had four fish because I remember catching four fish in front of TJ. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Ron. (laughs) But I had four fish within like 20 minutes. And then I kind of, my bike kind of slowed down and he started, where you started catching them on the Demiki quick. Yep. And those were all, I think they were all, um, almost all of them before the big one were all f- over four. Yep. I think so. And it was a mix, but I think there's a good chance I had. Most of them were all over four. Yeah, because I didn't think I said, I'm five. And you're like, shut up, you have three over four. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was it was funny because I'm pretty sure that that five you caught was adjacent to the bank. So. Not I mean, on the yeah. bank. No, I bombed that in thing the flat out. flat adjacent to it. I bombed that way further out than all my other casts. Yeah, but not like, I mean, it was far, but as far as like from the shore From the out, shore out, I mean, It wasn't yeah. that far. It no, was just far it... from the point we were fishing. Right, yeah. So relative to the road, you were still kind of in that, that next adjacent flat. Yeah. 
So mm-hmm. let's circle back to the beginning. We'll start with Wednesday because what we did on Wednesday and Thursday was identical to an extent, at least for a, a good portion of both days. It was pretty much the same thing. Jake, to answer your question, football head, Jake, at least I can tell you that almost everything was a football head. And even surprisingly enough on my Demiki that I got two, four pounders on. I'm pretty sure both two, four pounders. I caught Sunday. Yeah. And I got one too on the Demiki. Yeah, that was the four. That and was half, a four, three over four pounds on a Demiki on a stupid <laughs> half ounce football. It makes that was no my sense. First but ever Demiki we'll fish ever. Like, <laughs> when it comes to what we do, when we're targeting end of the year trophy smallmouth, steep rocky banks are key, but it's not that simple. It's not just as simple as to pull up to a steep rocky bank. Um, Mary, sorry, I want to answer your question too because this totally plays into it. Uh, when you guys got those bass in 35 to 50 feet, were you using your electronics to locate them and or balls of bait fish, also any on blades? Electronics have been key, but no bait. No bait anywhere on any of these fish that we were marking. I saw one tiny little bait ball, and it was tiny, maybe the size of a basketball. It was yeah. small, and that was all we saw all day. You had to watch your graph like a hawk on these points because... It's not, as I said just a moment ago, it's not just as easy to pull up any rocky point. 95% of the lake this time of the year is unproductive. Maybe you can catch some good fish or, you know, a couple of fish here and there, but for like the true trophies, they are all hunkered down into a handful of prime spots. Mm -hmm. Just absolute key areas. If you can figure those out and it takes a long time, then you can get them. And electronics are key because they don't always show up and neither does a bait until you rip a bait by them and you have to watch your graph like a hawk and all of a sudden it will look like there is nothing on the bottom by your graph and all of a sudden boop, just real quick up and gone right back down and they're smushing their belly into the dirt and they're down there Mm -hmm. hunkered the hell down and they want nothing to do with it until you present it just the right way so that's what we have found in the last few years as far as like okay this is kind of it they're either on the steep rocky banks and it's not just enough to say rocky it's got to be like the highest level of variety of rocky banks it's All like right. almost ledge slash riprap with a lot of sand in the middle a couple with of big, big boulders, boulders here and, and there and... like contours and stuff like it's an ugly ass looking pile of like crap. something you wouldn't want to throw your jig into because you know you're going to lose it bingo that's i mean honestly we really didn't lose too many jigs no not since i made those knockers no i'm <laughs> Oh, yeah. The it's, plug knockers. Yeah, yeah those the, are cool. The bait plugs, knockers, whatever you but, want. I mean, we would have lost a lot more if we didn't have those there. Seriously. We salvaged a ton. I we think only I lost went, like three. I went through six, seven of my own. Yeah. But we did pretty good. So once you can put in the time in the water, because there's no other way to do this, unless someone's willing to share these, these spots with you, which for us... Last year, absolutely. For this one particular body of water, we were absolutely shared a lot of information. You still had to go out there and capitalize, right? You have to put in the time to know what they want to eat, how they're going to eat it, colors, I mean, size, weight. Where we were killing them in the beginning of the day, though, I mean, we had found that spot three weeks, three ago, weeks ago. Yep. A month ago. Yeah. We just kind of like stumbled across this one spot where it's like, because we usually fish this one area, but we never kept going down the bank. Yeah. So then we end up, we're just like, fuck it, let's just go down this. And that's when the trolling motor fell off. Or the, the prop fell off. Yeah, the trolling motor. That yeah. Fun. <laughs> so we found this spot and we're like, this looks good. This this should be good in a couple weeks here. Because the fish were already there, obviously. They were getting ready. Yep. And they were there. And that's just, it, like, I mean, you go down 100 feet down the bank and they're not going to be there. They're literally on that spot. It's crazy how much they condense, not just to an area, but to a specific point within that very specific small area. And you have to root them out. John, to answer your question, how are we seeing the fish without forward-facing sonar? Watching my graph like a hawk, just traditional 2D sonar, and waiting for one of those little bastards to pop up for a brief second. A lot of the times what was happening was as I was ripping my bait back for another cast, I would drag it almost back to the boat. So at this point, even in 50 feet of water, I'm still trying to drag my feet, my, yeah, my bait almost underneath my feet. It's only 20 feet out. So I rip it up. It's going to swing towards me a little bit before it comes up. And just that action enough was enough for any fish that was inside, you know, that the visible, you know, the vision of the cone of my graph of my uh, transducer. I'd see them come up a little bit. 
you know, really faint line, and they're kind of the, the hairy edges of what the cone can see. Nice big broad line. Those bastards are right underneath the boat. So that's how we were seeing them. I, <laughs> Vance. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> um, so, oh, man, I lost my train of thought. This is kind of the only downside to being able to, like, bounce back and forth between, like, the point I'm trying to make and going, like, you know, responding to the chat. But... That's our starting point. That is the absolute basis for what we do when we're looking for smallmouth. It's a lot of time in the water, unless you're fortunate and you have amazing friends that are willing to share some productive areas with you. But those those productive areas don't always hold up. And you might be able to go and find like another 10 spots identical to a spot you already know is killer, but they're not going to hold fish. You have to check every single one because some some days... You literally spend some an entire years. day on just one spot. Right. Not even exact. We, I'm not, that's pretty much what we did. Yeah. On... Three spots. Three spots. All the fish were held up on those. And it's, I don't know if it's just the timing of it because the water was still warm in the last year or if it's like a cyclical change every year. Because any one of a dozen spots in this lake could be a phenomenal wintering hole for these fish. Last year, there was two spots. That was it. Mm -hmm. Granted, I didn't know about another like six to eight spots out of the 12 to 16 spots I know about now that I think were productive. But but that's where they were, though. That's where they were. And even guys I know are fishing, they're like, that, those were the spots. Now, this year, those spots aren't the spots. They have a little different now. (laughs) So we've been shifting around and it's been paying off in, in, in spades so far. So, main point, right? Steep rocky banks, but it's got to look ugly as sin, like Andrew said. Shit you don't want to throw your jigs into, but I'm promising you, you want to. Step one. Step two, closer to the shore. This late in the year, as juicy as those offshore rock piles look, and you're talking like hundreds of feet and further from the mainland, I they haven't been that productive for me this time of the year. Not to say they can't. Maybe I just haven't been that fortunate yet. But you're better off fishing mainland steep rocky banks and mainland points. From there, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it, the thing we learned last year, the flats adjacent to those steep rocky banks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) People have a really hard time when they start trying to fish open water for the first time. They're like, there's nothing out here. There's nothing. It's flat. Right. But you get like... There's fish out there. (laughs) And it it becomes a lot easier when you fish a place like, say, Squam Lake, right? That place is hump heaven. There is so many crazy contours to that lake under the water. It's it's insane. But that could be... That can be bad, though. It can be good and bad. It can be good good and bad. It's good in the sense, like, if you're trying to get comfortable fishing, like, deep open water, like, 35 plus feet... And actually, there's a lot of good deep water structure out there, even down to like 65 and 70 feet. So if that's what you want to do, and you may not catch a bunch of trophy smallmouth out there anymore, but you can catch numbers. If you want to go up there and get comfortable, like that makes it easy. Yeah, you're out in the middle of the lake, but you're like, you're fishing this crazy big, like 200 foot diameter hump. And it's got like a rock pile here, rock pile there, vegetation, the whole nine yards. Speaking of vegetation, Jake, I did see your question. I'm going to get back to that. Um, So it, it makes it a little bit easier. Because you have, like, defined structure that, yeah, it's 40 feet below your feet, but it makes sense, right? Like, a boulder is a boulder. You're just casting to it differently. Right. Now we're talking dragging literally nothing in 50 feet of water, 100 feet from the bank. If just, not more. Right. <laughs> or, or half a mile uh, from the bank or flat. whatever. Or, like, we were in Ontario, 20 miles from the bank. <laughs> <laughs> That was the weirdest thing to get used to, being that far out offshore. And then once we got out there, being a mile from the freaking land we were fishing. Yeah, a mile from an island, 20 miles offshore. <laughs> but it was so good. What the hell are we doing out here? It's just weird, but they, it, it's, I don't know, it's really hard to explain. It, all you got to know is that it works. Um, so th- those are the two biggest things, is location and above all, also that time in the water, because... You have to put in the time to understand and identify what are potentially good key areas. And then you have to go out there and put in the time to actually try and find those fish. You have to see if you can mark them. Most of the spots we fish, there are no bait present. We don't see them. We don't mark them. We rarely get bit by them or catch them. Last year, we had better luck actually catching a bunch of perch in the spots we're fishing. But it's... I don't know how else to explain this. They, a lot of it becomes kind of intuition at a certain point when you have a really good day in the spot. You're literally not marking anything. 
because mm-hmm. they're pinned. They're not going to come close to the boat, but they're out there and they're feeding. So again, time in the water is very, very key. Fish live in the water. They're going to use all of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like they just sit on rock piles all year long. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they do. But there's also times where they are off those rock piles out in the middle of absolute nowhere. They could be sitting in 100 feet of water, but they're halfway up. They're sitting, they're suspended in 50 feet. Like, it all depends on where they want to be at a certain time. Right. And <clears throat> this time of the year, as the water gets closer to at this point, we're, we're chasing kind of like that magical 45 degree mark. They become a lot more predictable at that point. That 50 to 45 degree window is still transition time for a lot of smallmouth. So that's where not just those steep banks and, you know, long tapering points become key, but the flats immediately adjacent to them with like really deep water nearby, not super deep water, but like pretty consistent. Like if your banks are bottoming out at 40, 45, 50 feet, and then once they hit it, it is just a consistent flat outside of that. That's another good key area to be looking at because that's, really a depth they like to be at whether they're hugging the bottom or they're 10 feet off the bottom like they can find that water temp they want to be comfortable at and from there just a short jaunt 100 feet that way or less they're up on the bank as the water dips closer to 45 degrees and colder then depending upon the weather conditions and um water temps the whole nine yards they can either move up or move down but having not only the rocks but also good sand and mud on the rocky points the banks at the bottom like that's key I've heard of many guys that have caught fish super late in the year, like 35 degree water temp, both fall and spring, where they're literally pulling up fish that are caked in mud. Yeah. That's another thing to keep in mind. Um, that, that, more than anything, is probably the two, three most important points that we can share as far as location goes. Yeah. But it means nothing if you're not willing to put in the time on the water to get there. And Once you catch your first deep smallmouth... You'll, you'll understand. Yeah. You'll you'll get it because you'll literally be sitting in nothing and then be like, oh, well, if I had 360, what's over there? And there could still literally be nothing over there. Right. Like, we've been in a, we've been in actually plenty of spots and even actually past this past Sunday, we did the same thing. We were out far enough off the bank. We were a hundred. We were further than 150 feet from the bank and we were catching fish. Not crazy big ones, but good ones. Uh, but for the most part, like within a hundred feet of the bank, so on the flats adjacent to it, but still a hundred feet off the bottom of that bank and flat of nothing, that's where we're catching still really good fish. Mm-hmm. So don't get too caught up on having to fish the bank. That's just like a prime location. <clears throat> and it kind of helps to let you know you're pinpointed in the right area. Keep an open <laughs> mind. You have to read the lake. You have to read the fish. If you can get over the top of it with your sonar, you're either going to mark some bait in there. Um, there was actually one spot where we marked what I think was a lot of perch, but it was literally at the one spot. Yeah. They um, were stacked like cordwood. Yeah. But otherwise, you, if it's a good spot, you're going to mark at least a couple of small mouth. Could be large mouth too. Um, you know, you get over a cluster of like three or four of them together and you'll see one or two boomerangs hanging off the bottom. Good enough. That's all you need to see. You mark at least one good fish. There's a good chance there's a ton more in there. You just can't see them. They're either staying outside of a range of your boat or they're pinned to the bottom, just absolutely sucked down, hunkered down in that mud. Mm-hmm. Um, real quick, coming back to the chat. Ronald, congrats on the five pound, three ounce bass and the jerkbait today. It's a tank. Uh, we've, I've never used a mini spinnerbait. Have you? Like, I have a bunch for my kid, but I haven't used any myself. They're like, they're like that big. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I heard and they I, really good in the spring. Yeah. Me and Keith used micro chatterbaits for crappie once. I remember that. <laughs> you guys did really good like too. like 60 of them. It was <laughs> sick. Um, Jake, you're welcome. And yeah, Cam, I got we got a lot in Tamiki Rig. We're going to go over that next. Um, answered that for John. All right, Jake. Any vegetation in these areas, and do you consider this their wintering areas or at least near two? My best areas have rock, shop contours, eh, shop co- sharp contours. Thank you. Uh, deep, deep water access and perch grass or shell bed. I yes. Mean, that honestly sounds perfect. And yes. And yes. <laughs> so the thing that we have found that's most common in this particular body of water, these most productive wintering holes that we found have really good vegetation really close by on the shallow side of the areas. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know if it matters or not because it's weird because this this entire lake has vegetation around it. It's not like this one area is that much more special, but at the same time, it kind of is because there's actually like really big patches of vegetation right yeah. next to it. Now I think about it. These fish can go from a huge chunk of really good like water that you'd want to fish and a big size of it in five feet of water or less to what I would consider a wintering hole, right? Like nice big deep hole, 50 plus feet near um, like adjacent to long points and steep banks, 500 feet away in a 500 foot swim. These fish can live their entire lives. That's it. Pretty much. Yeah. All year round. They have everything they need inside of a 500 foot stretch. I think that plays a big part into why those big fish like to hang there. Yeah, they don't have to go far. They're just going, okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Go back to bed. <laughs> um, Miles, if you're too scared to lose your bait, you're not fishing your bait to its potential. That is the damn truth. Pays to play. Yep. Um, Mary, is it basically they're hanging out for the winter in the deep bowls near their spring spawning flats? Yes and no. Because a lot of these spots that we find towards the end of this year are nowhere near spawning flats. Some are, some aren't. So it's one of those, it, it's sometimes yes, but not enough that I would say that that would be a key point to look for when you're looking for these wintering holes. Um, And yeah, Carl, you're absolutely right. Smallmouth move way, 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 way more than largies. That's why it's always a gamble to try and rely on a smallmouth bite or tournaments. If you're not there, like finding that pattern, that school the day before, it's going to be kind of pretty, it can be very, very tough to hold that pattern the next, never mind, next weekend. I don't want to rephrase that. It can be tough to find that pattern and bank on it even within 24 hours, never mind within a week. Smallmouth move like crazy. Um, John, I don't know off the top of my head what the deepest of that lake is, truthfully. Uh, also, truthfully, if I did know, I wouldn't say it because I don't want to give away too much information about this specific body of water. David, hey friend. Glad you could join us. Hi. <laughs> uh, Ron. Oh, yeah. Mini chatterbait. Got to find one from ever near me before a waterfall. Never freezes. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Could have cleaned that pond of crappy that day if we wanted to. I, we really could have. <laughs> Vance. How do you manage a hook set or compensate for the stretch from Floro? <laughs> Give her the freaking dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Give her the corn. And grab a moxie while you're at it. <laughs> Well, I was fishing 20 to 35 feet, and I'm on the bank, so I was making really long casts to get to the spot. Had five bites, screwed up every one. You kind of got to let them eat it yeah. for a second. Like, once you feel that weight or feel them hit it, just give it, like, just a half a second to think about, okay, now I'm going to reel, and then... Right. Because, yeah. Give them a chance to get the thing down. That's, that's the most important thing. The other thing, Panda beat me to it. We definitely need more info on what your gear is because um, it's kind of hard to state. I was running two jig rods when we were out fishing this the, both these past trips. Um, one's kind of a backup jig rod, but it's definitely a little overkill. But eh, kind of my remember. primary jig rod, seven foot two inch, medium heavy, fast, uh, straight fifteen pound fluorocarbon. That's what, exactly what I have. Yep. And then my backup one is using is basically a flipping stick, seven foot six, heavy fast. Also with 15 pounds straight forward carb, but it's got backbone. If I'm fishing my 7.2 medium heavy, and I mean, how how far do you think I can cast that when it was fully lined? 200 feet? Uh, yeah, probably close to that, yeah. With a half ounce jig. Oh, yeah. See ya. I, I have that with my hyper mag down to a T. I, I can bomb, absolutely bomb that thing. 200 feet without bat and eye. Um which doesn't sound far because a lot of people tend to talk in yards when they talk about casting distances. Those I people are cast wrong. 100 yards. Uh, I don't believe you. 120 <laughs> to 150 yards. So your guesstimation is 90 feet apart? <laughs> Somewhere in there. <laughs> so you know how far you cast, but not within 90 feet of accuracy? Because you people are dumb. Stop talking about yards. It's feet. <laughs> feet, people. <laughs> Oh, I can easily bomb at 150 feet. So four, 150 yards. So 450 feet. You can cast 450 feet. I want to see your that. Of time. So anyway, um, <laughs> it's further further than a freaking football field. Yeah, that's a one and a half football fields. <laughs> no, um, you're not. <laughs> where, are you, where are you casting? I don't know. That one I had on? probably had about four football fields on it. That freaking that drop shot weight. <laughs> oh, yeah, <it> <laughs> Dude, that. I okay. 
One quick little story. I sent this <laughs> drop shot weight, dude. It had to be, and honest to God, it had to have been 600 feet. Dude, easily. <laughs> and it probably went, no, it was probably. Who knows how high it I was. I have no idea how high it took about 10 seconds for it to hit, though. <laughs> We're not joking. Not exaggerating in any way, shape, or form. Like, you, you ever go to, like, cast, especially drop shot weight, and it breaks off at, like, the absolute most perfect apex of your arc? Yeah, that goes. <laughs> That's what he did on a, like, violent cast. It. A half hit. ounce, I think it was, or three eight. I think it was three eights. Is you either, either three eights or half ounce? Either way, three eights gone. If that happens, <laughs> it broke literally at the perfect, absolute apex of the arc of the cast. And it, I don't and it see went, it. And we're sitting there like, because you know, every time we do that, we know it's going to go far, right? It's going to have hang time, and, and it's funny. <laughs> it's like four seconds in, we start looking at each other, and the smirks get bigger and bigger. Like, like, and then it's like it... five, six seconds, and we're like. Where did it go? <laughs> We're like, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> we were dying laughing so hard. I I was like, we were talking about for the next 10 minutes. I was like, I would love to, like, you know when you ever watch golf on TV or at least seen a clip when they hit the ball, they've got like the red arc in the air to track its yeah, flight I path. See that. I want to see that. For that I want to see how fast, I want to know how fast it was going. Dude, it must have, <laughs> you would have to track it like a golf ball. <laughs> T speed, 250 miles an hour. <laughs> the arc beautifully, no deviation left or right whatsoever. <laughs> because it's made of tungsten. <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking All right, so I don't rods. know what we're talking about. Oh, yeah, rods. So if I'm fishing my 7 foot 2 medium heavy casting rod, 15 pound straight floral, I am giving it the dinner. I am going to set that hook hard. I've got an 8 3 to 1 speed ratio. So depending on how I feel and hit it, Typically, the time it takes me to reel down and drop the reel, the rod tip all the way to the water before I give it a massive hook set. At this point, we're talking like hundred plus feet for how much, like how far out my jig is, and in like forty feet of water. I'm gonna try and break my back setting the hook to make sure I get it. But that little hesitation I have between like, yep, I've got a bite to reel down, rod tip down, so I get as much slack up as I can and set it is usually the time it gives them to get that extra chomp chomp to really get the bait down. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to that's give why that always extra like, hesitation. That's why I was like, oh, uh, 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 okay, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> now, the closer to the boat and the shallower the water, I don't quite try and break my back on the hook set, but I still have not necessarily a hard hook set. I have a violent hook set. I have a very, very fast hook set. Yeah, that's quick. Mine's just, I don't know. I just dropped it was the a hammer. It's a great hook set. Just drop the hammer. Yep. Actually, I, I went the last time I bought a driver. The guy was like asking these questions like, I don't know. I barely golf. I just, I don't have a driver anymore. He's like, okay, we'll step into the swing thing. I'm like, okay. And he's like, what's your swing speed? You bring it back really fast? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> come through on my forwards. I come through it as fast as I do coming back with a hook set. Oh, Jesus. He's like, what's your swing speed? I'm like, I don't know. What's typical? He's like, oh, I don't know, 150. I, think. I, forget, I honestly forgot what he said. I'm like, okay. And uh, he's like, go ahead. Give it what you got. It's like. All right, so I swung like I usually do. I swing, and he looks at me, he goes, holy shit. It's, two, it's 210 mile an hour swing. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it was, I, I I could be wrong. I really couldn't remember this wrong, but I'm pretty sure he said it was over 200 miles an hour or whatever. Or maybe it was the, the ball off the tee. I don't fucking remember. It's not that important, but I, I just remembered it. Gary, what's um, up, my frozen friends? What's up? <laughs> hey, by the way, Jerry, I need to contact you for the end of this month. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You do that. I got to talk to you about some things. Are you friends with them on Facebook? I'm about to be. Get that done. Um, so, but if I'm using the 7.6 heavy fast rod, it's still going to be kind of like a fast hook set, but I will slow it down by about half a pace. And instead of bring like, I don't go all the way up and over with my other rod. I come up just past vertical, like just a little bit. If I'm using that 7.6, I'm going to stop almost vertical, maybe even a little bit in front because I've got a much stiffer rod. So I don't need to hammer it home. And I learned that lesson the hard way again when I overset the hook on. I caught the first four pounder on Sunday, and then I dropped the giant right after that. I watched the video back again. I definitely had a fish. Oh, dude, I saw that. I hooked it for I on the line for like three seconds, and then I lost and went, it. Oh, um, you're like no! I was like, yeah, get another one. I did <laughs> right Still after, hurt. pretty much. <laughs> um, Jesus, we missed a lot. Man, using using a Denali seven three three quarter ounce deep by Beast Coast twenty pound floral. Okay, so what else did everybody already say in the chat? I don't know. <laughs> John, back of my day, I could cast a wacky rig a quarter mile <laughs> over the mountains. Uh, I'm just trying.
trying to catch up on chat here. Same thing we did. We'll give him a second. Okay, so yeah, Vance. Panda had it spot on. You already got it. Thank you, Panda. Just give him another I second. I mean, a lot of times when we're we're sitting there and we're we're dragging these jigs and we think we might have a bite, nine times out of ten it's a rock. Uh huh. Because you'll be like, because you get your your bait's down in the water, your line falls, but your line is still doing this action from from the boat to the bait. There's, I couldn't even tell you how many times I thought I had a fish because you're bringing up, and you feel you you feel. You can feel the line straightening out through the water, so it feels spongy like there's a fish there, but yeah. there's actually no fish. I can't down, even, it's, downside to long soaks with heavy weighted fluoro because fluoro sinks. Yeah. So you get um, 150 foot cast but it keeps into 45 bottom. feet of water into a rock with long soaks for it to, you know, not only you hit the bottom, but now you're waiting like 30 seconds. So your line is still going down. So you know, like you said, you go to set the hook and it's stuck, but you feel in your line coming up. You're like, oh, that's a giant, that's a giant, that's a fish, that's a fish, that's a fish. And you set there, it's like, Rock bass. <laughs> Rock. Mm. <laughs> Every time. But that's also what happened when I caught the 528. I was, watched that back. And? It was glorious. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I watched the rod. And you were like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a rock. I really thought it was a rock. I lifted up and I was like, ah, shit. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Um, that was insane. With some weeds, how's it going, buddy? And thank you very much. That's <clears throat> Jesus Christ. I need water. That's what we're talking about right now. It's kind of going in everything. Uh, Ron can see football size smallmouth circling before waterfall. Can't get them to hit anything. Suggestions? <sighs> Wait, football sized smallmouth circling before waterfall? I'm assuming they're up shallow. And if that's the case, they're. Jerk throw them something big. Jerk bait. This time of the year, you either jerk bait, throw them something either big or tiny. Like go opposite ends of the spectrum because that's the thing we find, especially this time of the year, which is another aspect that I wanted to cover this, right? Quick recap what we did earlier. We steep rocky banks and points and the flats adjacent to them. The only way to find the most productive ones, you have to put in time in the water and actually go and fish every single one to figure out which are the ones that are holding the bulk of the fish. Most important thing to remember with smallmouth fish, they school by size. If you're getting a two pounder, two pounder, two pounder, two pounder, you're never going to get over two pounds. There might be one big rare. one in there. You get a four, stay. Yeah, don't <laughs> you're go on them. You don't need to go anywhere else. Case in point. Yeah, we're working the baits. So I was same spot, same place. I caught my PB from the same place he caught his first PB, literally within hundred feet of each other. Mm-hmm. You could have caught my fish. No, I'm kidding. Couldn't have been. <laughs> could have been. No. It wouldn't no. have grown that much. How much? Is, how? I was 5.04. No. Here's a 5.20. Yeah, maybe no, not. Totally different fish. There's been so many big fish caught over there. Yeah, I know. There's different fish. I know. Um, the, oh, Jesus Christ. What did the tail on yours look like, though? I don't know. Have to go back and look at the picture. Mine had a black spot. It's on, on the thumbnail. We'll have to look at it. It's literally my PB versus your PB. The 5.28 versus the 5.04. <clears throat> um... So with, if you can, what the hell was I just talking about, man? Maybe lose my train of thought. Sorry. You. We we talked about we we talked about. What did we talk about? <laughs> oh yeah, he was talking about the waterfall and small oh, baits, big baits, baits, right? Different size of baits, right? So that's right. I recapped the where's and the why of the where. More importantly, again, you have to put in time in the water to eliminate bad water. So with that, now the baits. I'm, I'm, sp I'm, <laughs> I really am hesitating for a very good reason because we've been talking about this a lot. Like how much of this do we want to share? Because there is quite a few baits that we have that are insanely productive. Most of them we've figured out on our own. Some we have not. So we don't really know other people that fish these things. So it's, it's one of those, like, we're here to help you guys at the same time. We don't want to give away our juiciest secrets because they are killing it. And that's, I don't know, like... I think a reasonable level of selfishness on our parts, <laughs> which is fine. I'll be selfish. Yeah. It, it took a long time to figure this out and it, it's not just the bait. It's the cadence and everything. So there's a reason that there, that is the reason why I'm hesitant to share so much of the baits, what we do, but there is still some baits we can talk about. So without further ado, baits, 
Size and color matters. How many times have I said color is everything when it comes to smallmouth? Uh huh. Has it changed whatsoever with the water temperature dropping? Nope. Not at all. Not one damn minute has it changed. Now, their color preference has changed multiple times in a minute. <laughs> oh, Jesus, yeah. It's crazy, even in the last couple of trips. Like, not just this spot, the last two trips, but the two trips before that. You know, throwing, like, a lot of our go-to baits, right? A lot of what we're doing is finesse baits on a variety of football heads. Three-quarter ounce was incredibly great for us last year. Now this year we're finding out it's not quite as good. Bumping up down to a half ounce or even a three eighths ounce has been much more productive than the three eight, the three quarter. We we're still catching big fish last year, but I think we could have got a lot more if we switched if we had switched if, down. Yeah, lightened it up a little bit because we were fishing in deep water and we we're like, well, we want to get it down there and make sure it's down there and too. make sure it's down there. That half ounce will get down there. You just got to let it, let it get down there. Right, <clears throat> patience is key. Mm-hmm. What's going on, Papa? It's funny because we were talking about this on the way home. We're like. It's just easy. Like it's not hard. But then you're like, yeah, but we've done it. <laughs> and we're used to it now. Right. And I never really looked at it that way. No. It's Before like skateboarding. There. You know how to kickflip. You know how to kickflip. You know how to all. You know how to all. It's easy. Right. But <laughs> not everybody knows how to do that. No. And like me. <laughs> I never learned how to ollie. It's easy. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, wait, I missed it. Sorry, hang on. Dan, all the fives on the open water sniper, not the Dabiki? Mm, no. Nope. The open water sniper has been good, but not for the fives. So, the thing we're finding the most with our big fish is there is a narrow range of, like, the overall thing, right? It's Let's say it was the open water sniper with a three and a half inch craw in all black. Which actually would probably be a really good combo to throw anyway. But that's not it. Yeah, it wouldn't be bad. Um, actually, actually, that would be yeah, I'm not that. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the reason why my brain went there, because I specifically thought of something that could be good. Anyway, so let, we'll just say it was that, right? Half ounce, open water sniper jig, all black with a three and a half inch black craw. That had been, we'll say, the ticket last year when we were doing this and we were really honing in on a more consistent, though by no means actually consistent or easy, big fish bite. Go back the next day, throw that exact same all black three and a half inch trailer, get absolute squat. Remove the trailer, or not the trailer, remove the skirt, bingo. And they were lighting it up like their lives depended upon it. Go back the next day, wouldn't touch either one. Okay, go all green pumpkin, boom. Lighting up like their life depended on it. Back the next day, throw the green pumpkin, throw the three blocks, nothing. Throw the skirt back on. Now it's a skirted three quarter ounce, or uh, three eighths ounce with a three and a half inch. Like magic. They start smoking it. And then in the middle of the day, that bite disappears. What the hell's going on? He's like, I'm going to try slightly, I'm going to go down to a two and a half inch trailer. Boom. Yep. They're on it's it just... again. The variety inside of two freaking, actually technically one bait when two colors is insane. The skirt matters. Sometimes not having a skirt matters. Three and a half inch versus two and a the half. The length inch. of the skirt. The like, length of the skirt has been like that's been a big difference for a lot of our like fall bite too. We found that out like a month and a half ago. We were fishing for we had that great largemouth day, mm -hmm. and you and I were fishing two entirely different jigs, and I was killing it because I was fishing the open water sniper, which is a, a more subtle or finesse skirt yep. compared to a traditional <clears throat> jig. And I th yeah, I was just throwing a regular jig, and they weren't. They weren't having it. It was literally the only difference between what him and I were doing. We were fishing the same trailers and the same colors and the same weight head. I was throwing the open water sniper, finesse skirt, versus a the traditional, traditional I, don't even, I don't remember what the hell it was saying. Uh, Max Fuel. Max yeah. Drag. Uh, whatever the hell it is. I The, the uh, friggin' football tungsten jig from Beast Coast. Max yeah. Feel. Max, I think it was Max Feel. Yeah, yeah. Max Feel. They um, didn't want anything to do with it. It was bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> But that's it, especially when it comes to these trophy smallmouth. You're going to be able to find, eventually, probably a lot of people already know, um, and I'm glad that nobody is, like, spilling the beans on this, because if you know, you know. I hate that phrase, but, eh. You know, um, you know, you know. It is killer. And when you get to that, and actually, there's got to be a whole host of freaking baits that can work. I guarantee, I have been throwing the open water sniper, but only a few times, because then, like, we'll get to a spot, 
him and I will start picking it apart with like our go-tos, right? And uh, Blade Bait has definitely been in the mix, but it hasn't produced yet this year, which is weird. Last year, it killed it. And he starts his confidence. I'm starting my confidence. Almost the same bait, different colors. Like five, six cast, nothing. Open water sniper, five, six cast, nothing. Go back to the other bait. Boom, catch a fish. Nothing for a little bit. Try the open water sniper. Come back to the other bait. Boom, another fish. Okay, I just put that down and go with the other bait for the rest of the day. Yeah. So <clears throat> not to say it, ha- it can't work. It should. There's a reason why I bought a ton of them, specifically this time of the year. I just haven't put a ton of time into it. They'll bite it for sure. Yeah. But just we go straight to our confidence when it's freezing out and we don't want to sit there and, and try something new. Right. <laughs> we just want to kill fish on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> Especially, I mean, there's still a narrow window here that we've had success doing this, but the success has been phenomenal. Not just this season, a lot of last season too. And even the year before, like we've gotten a lot better at it because we've put in the time to figure this out. So, to recap one more time, I get a cash back up in the chat because I, had to, I backed up the answer to question. Um, size and color matter so, so much at this time of the year. Really, really tiny or freaking huge. One of the two. Sometimes there's a little bit of leeway where we're finding that the bite is preferred for somewhere in the middle. But 95% of the time, it's on either side of it. With that said, there's questions I want to answer in the chat, but before I get to that, that said, what do you think has been more important for us on these days we're having our success? Color or size? And size, for the record, doesn't necessarily mean length, but also bulk. That'd be like skirt versus no skirt on your jigs. That's a tough one. They almost hand in hand, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, you need the size in the right color. Yep. It's not just the size it's not just the color it's you need both you need it to be right yep you may get bit on one but then you may get bit on you may get bit on one size and then you may get bit on a different size but in a different color but you never know what you're actually going to catch if you don't put them together and make that perfect combination for them right that was hard to say (laughs) no but you got your point across great (laughs) Case in point, the last three trips we went out specifically to try and do this, right? All the last three trips have been trying to go catch giant smallmouth. I have had five or six. Did five or six rods set up with literally the same exact presentation with the only variance being one trailer is a little bit like a short trailer and a slightly longer trailer, skirt or no skirt, and then one color or the other, like, it's it's been six setups of almost the same thing with just a little variation between each setup because that's how dialed in we have gotten with this that like i'm that confident i have eight rods out in my boat six of them are all the same freaking jig thing and then one was a blade bait one was demiki rig <laughs> that's when you get there and you get it dialed in it's it's huge yep. it makes a big difference don't be afraid to go small baits <clears throat> on no. a big jig don't like, be afraid to go Big baits on a big jig. <laughs> like So, fuck it. Let's elaborate a little bit. What are we talking about for small? Length. Two to three inches. Um, and up to five, six inches. And even bigger. Yeah. You can go <laughs> seven bigger. inches, eight inches. Now, the plus side to throwing those big baits, they will still get bit this year, as I guess frequently as they would at any other time of the year. More importantly having some sort of finesse follow-up on hand ready to rock is ex- extremely important. Like a Daniki. <laughs> you can call them in and they might not eat, but they're going to hang. And if you can get that finesse bait down in front of them, there's a like strong, strong chance they're going to bite. So food for thought. We'll keep that up there. Um, and it's not really like giving away secrets or anything, but if you want to see how a Daniki is actually fished, Go watch uh, TJ um, Smallmouth Freak's video, new video on his Instagram. Oh, I didn't even see that. I yeah. Didn't, I didn't get the notification for it. Yeah. <clears throat> From the other day. It. Yeah. All right. It's good. Go. Smallmouth Freak's on Instagram. Go check his latest video out. Yep. Cam, going back into the chat here. Really learned that this year with the smallmouth, the size and color make the whole difference. I have favorite drop shot baits, but sometimes just packs of baits everywhere from everything, trying everything. It's, see? That's what you got to do. It's literally everything we just said too. I love it. You probably said that before we even talked about it, but yeah, dude, exactly. Spot on. Like color is key. And I've said it a thousand times and I'm the same way for drop shot baits. Um, 
I have like the Beast Coast Magic Flick accounts for like ninety percent of everything I catch in a drop shot. I have every color the guy makes. They are so freaking good. They're phenomenal. They match. They he has every color you could possibly ever even need to match the hatch for everything that New England has. It doesn't matter where I go. I've got a Magic Flick that's going to work for it. More importantly, now this past season he finally introduced a bigger version. So now he's got the three and a half inch and a four inch, which is really good because there's a couple of windows during the year and they're narrow windows where I cannot get them to p- touch a three and a half inch bait on a drop shot. Like literally I'll go there. I I can't even tell you how many times this happened in the last five or six years. I've gone out even a weekend before and absolutely hammered them on the drop shot. I mean, like your pizza analogy. Yep. Then there's that. <laughs> it's too um, freaking hot. They don't want to move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just lit them up with the, the standard flick three and a half inch and then come back the next weekend and they will not touch it. I get them. I watch them on my graph. They're coming up. They're sniffing it and they go back down. They are not coming back every single time. The moment I tie on a four or five inch tri- uh, bait on my drop shot, they instantly smoke it over and over and over again. Sometimes it matters. And the pizza analogy, same thing in the winter as is in the middle of summer. It's hot. They're uncomfortable. They don't want to move a ton. So if they're going to move, it's going to be for something that's actually worth their effort to chase it down. Give them something big. Same is still said, especially now in the really cold water months. They don't need to eat as often as their metabolism metabolism continues to slow down. So if they're going to eat, it's either like, okay, I'm pretty close to full and I'm just going to kind of nibble on this or my metabolism hasn't quite slowed down yet. So I'm going to continue to eat little things over and over and over again or... Shit, I'm you know hungry. What? Give me that damn pizza. <laughs> yeah, I want the whole large pizza. One shot. <laughs> that, that was me last night. I ate a whole damn pizza. That doesn't surprise me. And I forgot least. that I ate it. And I was still hungry. <laughs> uh, so, John, actually, back up one. Panda, also maybe try a hair jig. Yes. I have been able to catch a couple of fish in the hair jig finally, and that's something else that... I highly recommend, but we haven't done enough with it yet that it's something I really want to bring up because it's just something we don't do frequently enough yet. Um, John, is a trailer not actually a trailer? It is. A trailer, to me, is literally anything you can throw on the back of a jig. Mm-hmm. Literally anything. I know when you, you go to like certain tackle shops, they, they break it down like, you know, even though a swim bait is a trailer, they just call swim baits swim baits. And then they have trailers... And then they have craws, and then they have grubs. Like, they're Everything. all trailers. Anything you hook on the... <laughs> Anything you put on a hook is a trailer. A real worm is a trailer, technically. Even, <laughs> even something that looks absolutely stupid. Which one? Try it. What are you talking about? Our tournament day two. <laughs> so, you know what's funny? Yeah. That... Yeah. The, the those two tanks from Ontario I just showed you from our subscriber. I believe it. Open water sniper with that same bait that's the trailer. Son of Guess what gosh. we're doing Sunday? <laughs> we gotta try it. I ain't copying that. Fine, fuck you. I'll do it. I'll copy it. <laughs> well, uh, never mind. I got? Just kidding. I'm copying it. <laughs> no, it's too late. You're not allowed to. I did it first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bass and Panda one ounce. Dragon Custom Tackle heavy hitter jig with a seven inch Senko trailer. Yeah, that's the backer rack special, buddy. I would say it's probably too big for smallies. <laughs> Ronald, good idea. Can you throw a drop shot and just leave like live bait because of the current and use another rod? Oh, there you go. Yeah, for getting your uh, your waterfall fish. That should work. Um, dog swabby. Favorite Tamiki bait in size. Okay, so that's the other aspect of this. The thing is, I, I will get to that, but in a roundabout way. Most, more often than not, we're catching these fish on the bottom. Mm-hmm. We've said this how many times? A Too lot. many times. Slow dragging. And when, the reason why it's slow dragging is because we're trying to maintain bottom contact. It doesn't mean we're ne- always fishing slow. You were saying that the other day. We actually, you had a really good day. Well, actually, it was just past Sunday, and then even the trip before that, where you caught more fish than all of us. Where the hell was I? Where were we? Was that with Todd? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... um. You were fishing slow, and you were maintaining bottom contact, but at the same time, you were fishing slow. Slow, subtle movements, so the bait is still staying in the bottom, but you're like, drag, drag, drag. So, like, one to two second pauses, and you're only moving at about six yeah, inches at a time. Yeah, but then I would put one long pause in the middle of it. Yeah, 
but you're getting bit on both. You're getting yeah. bit on, on yeah. actually most of I think more often than not, you're getting bit on the, the short pauses yep. than the long ones. That was. So there's a there's a lot to be said for the the cadence for how you're gonna fish these things. A lot of the times you're going slow and you're going even slower still. And then from there you want to go even slower than that. That's the best way to get big bass. Your numbers are gonna go way down, but your quality goes way, way up. And I can personally attest to that watching one, him do it the last six years, and two, watching myself progress with my comfort level of fishing that slow and my average weight going way, way up. Way, way up. Want to fish in slower? Yep. Told you. I never denied it. I never I know, never I know, just I believed it. I know. I just had a hard you just time had telling to my do body it. to stop <laughs> going fast. Slow, 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 <laughs> slow, slow, slow. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Now, the other aspect of it is if we're not catching him on bottom contact, one thing I've been trying for years, literally years, to get comfortable fishing and confident with is the Miki rig. That has been key. It's taken three, like, I think three years now to actually sit down and fish it. Yep. Three years. That's sad. That's bad. Prior to that, blade bait. Because blade bait, you can fish either on the bottom or you're going to get them to react to it on the lift, and they're going to see it, and they're going to bite it either on the fall or when it's already on the bottom. So it's like, I don't, I don't really know how to put it that. Blade bait has usually been like the other go-to. If they're not going to hit something that's a drag on the bottom, then fishing a blade bait has been the key thing. But for me, my confidence with that only grows once the water temp hits 45 degrees or lower. The thing we found the last couple of weeks, and something I got really comfortable with back in September this year for the high school kids tournament, 65 feet i was catching smallmouth on a freaking drop shot but it was only or, uh, uh Demiki rig but i was dropping my bait down to 25 feet and holding it and they were coming all the way up like mo- most of them were actually 10 feet at the bottom so it was in 65 feet of water but they were at 55 feet and they would come up 30 feet to eat that bait it was crazy um i've had smallies come up 30 feet to hit a jerk bait i believe it makes me think we should have been fishing that recently too Yeah, probably but can't do it. Jig bites. Jig jig bite is I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of a hard but I still like jig bite more than jerk bait bite. That's just me. Yeah. So a, a lot of how we're fishing too, electronics become very key. Not only from marking the fish, but seeing how they're reacting, both in the baits that are going by and then just how they're they're bombing by, right? A lot of the fish that we are seeing, if I did see them, they were almost pinned. I would have to be already been looking at the graph. And that solid orange line would just start to turn a little red. And you almost wouldn't even be able to perceive that there is any sort of change in the height of the bottom, what looked like the bottom of the lake, but the color was enough to change. And that was, I was, I looked at him and remember, I think I caught two fish doing that. I was looking at him like, that color changed, there's a fish there. And it dropped down and sure enough, as soon as I got that bait within 10 feet of its head, came right up. Mm-hmm. I only got two of them, or it was probably two or three of them to bite, but I got way more than that to come up <clears throat> off the bottom and react. It helped me a lot being able to read those graphs. What? Like the 2D sonar. Yeah. Is using my flasher ice fishing. You can, you sit there and you s- literally staring at the screen for hours <laughs> and you notice the smallest little change on the bottom. And now we bring it to open water fishing and it's, it's the same thing. Yep. You, you notice those little differences the longer you stare at a screen. Right. And that's been huge. So, Demiki Rig. That's been key. Like, I've been watching these fish, especially as I'm reeling in my swim bait. That was what really keyed me into it. As I reel it in, again, drag to my feet. I mean, within 20 feet of the boat and 50 feet of water and then burn it up. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, from right underneath my boat, fish comes up 10 feet, right back down. So they're on the bottom and they've been feeding off the bottom, but they're looking up to feed too. So, Demiki rig down, hold it about 10 feet off their head because that's about as high as he came up off the bottom. Sure as shit. All of a sudden, a fish out of nowhere comes up, looks at it, and you had to wait a long time. Well, I'm, a few of those fish were willing to hit within, like, t- say, 10 seconds. But your arm wants to start spasming because you're trying to hold as dead still as possible. And that was the most key aspect of that for those bites. And I had a few fish both trips. That was 90 seconds I had to wait. And watch yeah. that fish come up and hang for 10 seconds, back down, almost to the bottom, and then... Just like watching paint dry, man. You can see him. You can see the line closing, come closing, closing. On, come on. <laughs> and then finally hang just below it. And then at the bait, 10 seconds and back down. <laughs> yeah. Just, I watched a fit. Yeah. I, 
I caught one that was probably three and three quarter pounds that did that four times. I almost said five, but I'm pretty sure it was like four times. Came up, down, up, down. And it was about 90 seconds and it finally bit. So it's it's a confidence thing to be able to have that level of patience to it. But I can tell you right now, it's worth it. Um, Dan Vermont is still definitely open. Yes. Um, Papa, absolutely. When you think you're going fish, when you think you're fishing slow, go slower. Panda, do smallies eat big straight tail worms or is that more of a big largey thing? Yeah, they'll eat them. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big, big time. Champlain. Yeah. True. This summer, mm-hmm. giant Sankos were like key, were huge for catching a lot of big smallmouth up on that lake this year. Hmm. Not for us, for other people we were talking to. Uh, and actually, one of our buddies did that the same day we were out there getting our teeth kicked in, at least for the, the, the morning bite before we went over and had a much better day. Uh, Mary, it seems that this year has been a special year of the water temps staying warm so late in the fall compared to the past years. When he was in the 50s into November, Labasse had a lot more food later. Yeah, it's... I don't know why either, because it's not like we had a really hot year, but I'm wondering if it's because we've had so much water, and the water is typically higher than everywhere else. It's just more mass for it. More mass to the water, so it's taking longer to cool down. And even though it hasn't been warm, it's been seasonably warm. Like, it hasn't been as cold most of these nights like right. we typically get. Yeah. So, I think the combination of the two. Um, yeah, Winnie was on crack this year. That's perfectly put, Cam. I don't even know how many seven-pounders were kicked out of there this year. There's actually several five-pound smallmouth, too. There's one. I think one guy caught a five-pound, 15-ounce smallmouth out of there this year. Maybe it was only five and three-quarter. I thought there was someone that caught one that was knocking on the door six, which for Winnie is insane for smallmouth. Unless there are people catching them and not posting about them anywhere, usually when someone catches a five-plus pounder on Winnie, everybody, everybody hears about knows it. about it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there weren't that many prior to this year. Only, I think there was two. There was two this year that I know of. Yeah, and I only like loosely pay attention to the information on Winnie. So that's yeah, I don't care about that place too much. No, <laughs> besides your one fish. Of course. Mm-hmm. Cam's here. That's where Cam and his buddy caught another seven-pounder from. Believe it. <laughs> that place, literally that's the same spot. one spot just so good. Yep. And I know um, another guy caught an eight pounder there in the spring. Same year I caught my PB. That's probably your fish. <laughs> good, man. <laughs> he said that too when he sent me a picture. He was like, your fish looked a little bit bigger in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> what a dickhead. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, so, all right, we've covered. Let's recap. Actually, really quick first, for those that are still here, one, thank you. Hugely awesome of you. Second, if you haven't hit like on the stream yet, please do so. That helps more than you know. Third, for those that are already subscribed, if you haven't turned on notifications for the channel or even any of the social media for that matter, please do that. That also helps a lot and uh, also makes it easier for you guys so you don't miss anything, um, especially with our infrequent video upload schedule. Sorry, working on it. <laughs> um, but otherwise, thank you all for being here. Greatly appreciate it. Recap. So, areas. You, you recap the areas first. Points of interest. When we're talking, what we're doing for Chase and Trophy Small about this time of the year, what are our primary areas to start looking at? Deep, rocky points. Yep. And? Deep, rocky flats. <laughs> <laughs> flats adjacent to the deep, rocky points. <laughs> All the juice. Um, Really looking for, like, sharp con- like sharp contour lines. Stuff with rocks, mixer of all different size rocks, whether it be ledge, like that rip rap stuff, big boulders, all that stuff mixed in with with each other. Yep. Um, the flats, pretty much just off that stuff, can literally have nothing. It doesn't have to have anything on it for structure. For structure. Um. That's pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. No. It's, I mean, there is a couple other things, but it's not. That's pretty much what we go looking at, looking for when we go out at yep. this time of the year. Bingo. Um, so that's part one of the recap as a whole for where we like to fish. Part two, baits. You need to have a good selection of finesse baits. It can be... Anything from Ned Rig bait, craws, swim baits, like literally anything that is a little finesse, anywhere from 
like two and a half inch to three inch with and without skirted options. I don't care if you want to do ball head or football head. I personally prefer football head. I want that bait to stand. Whatever it is I'm throwing, I want it to stand. And I want the same option with or without a skirt because some days the fish prefer the bulk of the skirt and other days they want nothing to do with that. You could literally fish the exact same bait trailer on there just without a skirt or literally the whole, the same bait just in a half an inch bigger. And that makes all the difference in the world. That's the other half of this when it comes to baits and presentations. Once you get key in on some good colors and you can keep it really simple, black, black and blue, green pumpkins, like basic, very natural colors will work most days. But you do want to start exploring outside of those. Understand what lakes you're fishing. What do they have for forage? It'd be even better if you can actually throw down like a trap and start getting some stuff to get in there and you can see like what's down there. Maybe throw down different kinds of gear to catch some of those fish down there and see what the bass are eating on. But first, check your state's regulations. Bingo. <laughs> Don't want to mess that up. <laughs> um, yes, Mary, actually, we are in Milford. That's where I live. Um, Me too. We're townies. We are. But being able to have that variety of baits, both finesse and big, like if you can get that same kind of setup that is something you're really like comfortable with, say it's uh, just a three and a half inch craw. Again, like the, the example I used earlier, three and a half inch craw, which is a simple skirted jig. If you're really comfortable with that, then fish it without the skirt. Find another craw of that same size and color that you like, but a different action. This time of the year, something like a Zoom Super Chunk is one of my go-to jigs because it has no action in the legs in the fall. That's what you want. You want something that if you're trying to imitate a craw, you can still get the profile of it. It's going to stand, but in the fall, it has little to no action, which is huge. So you can elaborate and continue to experiment with that, but have both ends of the spectrum ready. Because again, some days, and if you can throw both at the same time, then you are 10 times better off otherwise. Mm -hmm. You can find a spot that you think is going to hold them, or if you have a graph and you already marked a couple of fish, you know they're there. Ten casts with one small thing, ten casts with one big thing. If that doesn't work, I would always start with changing the small thing first, different color, and go pretty drastically different with it too. Just those two approaches account for like ninety percent of what you're doing out there, mm -hmm. and you're going to find success. But like that's just once you've found the good spots. Time in the water, man. You have to go out there and you got to bust your ass. You got to find those good spots and eliminate all the dog shit spots. Pretty much. <sighs> um, Cam, we give that like plenty of credit. No, we do. I just don't like it because there's so many goddamn people on it all the time. I'm all set. Can I don't I... like populated places. Well, and that's the thing. Like, <laughs> because of my family situation, my life, I can only fish Sundays. It's rare that I can plan on fishing something other than a Sunday. Everybody that's been on Winnie in the Summer knows that Winnie in the Summer sucks. On Sundays, it's 10 times worse. Getting there, dealing with the people that are already over the lake, and then the whole drive home on 93, I want to kill myself. I hate that freaking lake with, uh, I just, I hate it because I can only fish at Sundays. If I had the freedom to fish like on Saturdays, totally different animal. Before I had kids and I could fish any damn day I wanted to, I always went to Winnie on Saturdays and it was amazing. Because at that time, now, 10 years ago, there was, like, way, way less people than there are now. And, well, relatively speaking. But, like, it was smooth sailing the whole way up. Granted, we're leaving at 3.30 in the morning. Right. We get there, launch for 5, 5.30. The lake never got busy until, like, noon. The last two hours, it was starting to get kind of busy, but, like, still tolerable. Get back in. Everybody is already up there and loaded in for the lake for the week, you know, the weekend. Get to the ramp, nobody there, no lines, get on the highway home, not a freaking car on the road. Coming north is a joke. <laughs> yeah. Watch miles of traffic, Ugh. you know, but like, it was different. It was way, way, way different. You know, if for nothing else, even if the lake still sucks on Saturdays, the drive home on Saturday doesn't. You know, it's still only an hour and a half versus two hours, which is always nice. I just don't, I just don't like populated places like that. No. I don't even go to amusement parks anymore. I haven't been to the mall in 15 years. I don't know. Yeah. Well, wait, Cam, what, what's your work schedule? You next can, next week. Go. Next week I have Thursday and Friday off, and Friday I can fish. And then the last two days of the month, Monday and Tuesday, I got two days off then too. No, because you're going to catch a bunch of fish, and you would be like, all right, we're going. I'm just like, 
<laughs> no, we're not. No, no, no. You and I are going to the promised land, sir. All right, cool. We got Candlewood coming up, too. That's a lake. I'll always tell the name. Oh, and the river. And the river. The river down south. Uh-huh. Last, the last Monday of the month, December 27th, I have off. December 27th, I won't be here. Sucks for you. Actually, no, I will be. Figured you. No, I won't um, be. <laughs> Mary, hey, neighbor, we have seen Dennis Hart and his boat coming home. My hubby is Brian. Oh, yeah, yeah I know Brian. Used to be in uh, Bass Club. Thanks for tonight. We enjoyed it. Hey, very welcome. Thank you very much. You've probably seen me driving through, too. Big blue tundra with a big blue bass boat behind it. Kind of hard to miss. I'm usually the guy driving like an asshole. I'll freely admit. I'm sorry. Get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I can let you uh, uh, Yeah, Donk Swabby's on the same boat as you. Yeah. <laughs> Panda, I'll take Andrew's spot. <laughs> See? That's yeah. why I need to talk to you, Jerry. I need to figure yeah. out what the hell I got to bring down there. He's coming down. So I'm using a mud boat. Oh, yeah, yeah. You told was, me about that. There's a mud boat down there, I guess, that I'm using for a couple days. I don't know. That's going to be sweet. By myself in the freaking swamp down there. It'll be great. Don't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back with one arm. Yeah. John! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't break it, but... I need a lefty reel now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Mary, I have a uh, Blue Skeeter ZX200. Um, Carl, got away from it, but next year I'm going to throw the Carolina rig more. What's your favorite time of year? Throw it and tell me your line and hook size. All year. Yeah, pretty much all year. Actually, we were literally talking Ooh, about that on the ride home. I oh, yeah, no. That. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't forget about that. I know you didn't. You don't forget about anything. I forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try the Carolina rig this weekend. I know it works in cold water, but for the type of structure we fish, I have an idea to make it effective even fishing rocks. Really excited to try this. So we see how it's going to go. Uh, but I typically like throwing it. You can throw it all year long, but my confidence in it is post-spawn through till early fall. Especially when I'm fishing deep water on grass, I love throwing a Carolina rig. Fell, I, I used to throw it a ton. Kind of fell away from it the last two years. Fell back in love with it again. Well, kind of like last year. And then again this year really heavily, especially up on um, Lake Champlain. We killed it throwing a Carolina rig with just a striking rage crop. That was killer. As for line, I've done one of two ways. All fluoro or braid to a fluoro leader. Uh, if I'm doing straight fluoro, my main line is 20 pound. And then my leader is almost always 10 pound test. And I typically tie it about 18 inches long. Uh, my braid is the same as my top water rod. I don't have anything specific for Carolina rigs. So it's just 30 pound braid. Doesn't matter for brand or anything like that. And then I typically like a half ounce weight or three quarter ounce. Depends on how deep I'm going. Anything 20 feet or less, go half ounce. Um, anything deeper, I go three quarter ounce. Bead is optional. Bead is optional. I don't always throw it. Wait a minute. Jerry. Is he the one that used to bring the bass boat to the, the Milford yeah. Fishing Derbies? We were talking about him a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Um, am I getting active target for next year? Mine's away from Bass Fish Electronics. Nice, dude. Actually, the Jays. Yeah. They just bought one. What? Uh, active target. Did they? Live really? scope. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, now yeah. I cannot buy anything with gas. Now they're gonna months. start fishing finesse. No, dude. They're gonna, they're like many many a jerk bait fish will be caught with this thing. I'm like oh, actually, true. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a good freaking idea, dude. Live scope in their hands with a jerk bait. It's deadly. I feel bad for those fish. I really do too. <laughs> it's not even gonna be fair. <laughs> six pounder, six pounder, six pounder, six pounder, ten pounder. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. I I don't know, man. There's um things outside of my control, money wise, that were promised that have not come to fruition. I'll leave it at that. So, I should have already had it by now, and then some. As it is now, I don't even see it happening. But I'm still very hopeful. If it doesn't happen this spring, then there will be significant changes in my life that will make it happen for the fall. Simple as that. Uh, because if the things that were supposed to happen don't happen by then, then I'm going to make changes for my life. I'm not waiting around. Simple as that. I come back to haunt me to say that, but I just don't give a fuck anymore. I'm tired of just getting pushed around and not having people fucking follow through with shit that they promised me, especially when it comes to a lot of money. Watch the overgrown lizards you all call gators. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of worried about. <laughs> I've never seen one in the wild. 
when we think I'm surrounded by him. You should see how he almost <laughs> poops himself when we're out there fishing and a big old pike comes right up to the boat. Or even a pickerel, never mind a pike. I'm going to wear a diaper. <laughs> Josh is going to be like, what the hell was that? <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> um, John, how different are your deep summer spots compared to your deep winter spots? Oh, well, I mean, that's a loaded question. Yeah, it is. It, there's a lot of different. I mean, you also got to add in vegetation and everything that too, like live vegetation. And then relative to the lake that you're on. Right. Case in point, the new spot we went to up in Vermont with Robbie. Yeah. We were fishing deep water for that lake. 30 feet. Because the deepest it gets there is about 30 to 33 feet. And we were fishing in 25 feet. Right. Have a great night, Papa. Thank you for watching, buddy. Appreciate it. Um, See you later. I would say typically our summer deep spots for largemouth are like 20 feet. Rarely do we ever have to go deeper than that, but we are yeah. we don't really fish big, deep lakes for largemouth, so we never have to consider looking deeper than that. If we're going for largemouth. We typically stick to our usual kettle ponds and stuff like that. Uh, for smallmouth, it's kind of the same. For like where our comfort zone is and how well yeah. we do, deep water sm- summer, midsummer versus late winter, about the same, like 40, 35 to forty five feet. Actually, I would say winter is a little bit deeper. Yeah, winter is definitely a little deeper. I mean, depending feet. on how hot the water is in the summer. I mean, if you're fishing in water that's freaking eighty five degrees. I mean, they could also be in two feet of water. Smallies do push up super shallow when it's really hot, or Which, they're super deep. Right. There's no real in between, though. Yeah, no, not really. Yeah. You I, might get a couple out in like 25, but they're going to be 35, 40, 50, 60, right. 70, 80. Yep. Who knows? <laughs> Who yeah, really knows much- how deep they go? <laughs> I mean, we. Oh, Ruben. hey Dan! Hope you guys had fun at the Polar Express. See you later. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Like our, our, our in the summer they can their their range their depth range can be all over the place, but we do phenomenal from thirty five to forty five, sometimes even fifty feet. But like thirty to forty is pretty much the max where we need to be, and we do really really well doing that. Mm-hmm. In the winter, it's about five feet deeper than that. For like the the absolute bulk of the fish that we catch are in that window. So they're, they're pretty much the same, but I would say if, if I had to take a pick in the summer, typically it would be deeper <clears throat> where I think most people have more success. But for what the two of us do, our winter holes go deeper than our summer holes where we typically find our success. She clear, Hunter, huh? Here's a so takes your trying to standard definition to HD. Yes, Jerry, spot on. That is in the works. In the, uh, it's in the works. Everything's in the works. <laughs> That's in the books, in the plans for the next upgrade. Ideally, what I'm aiming for here, but I need things to happen. Um, all new graphs, because I like everything that I have right now, but I need to get a new one because I want to get active target anyway. And I'm going to stick with low rants versus Garmin. Um, so two new HDS lives, and I think I'm going to go two 12-inch, at least a 12-inch at the wheel, and I may even go to a 15-inch at the bow, because then I can still... I, I can, you know, I know I can kind of customize the screen size, but I can do active target on the bulk of it, but then split my traditional 2D sonar, because I still want that, even a little window, and then my map. I can do stacked on top of each other on like a quarter of the screen, and then the rest can be dedicated to active target. Even doing that on a 12-inch screen, that's a lot of real estate. Um, get rid of my Helix 9 and upgrade to a Helix 12, because I'm keeping Mega 360. It's not going away. Interlink everything again. Um, I get to get the separate turret from my buddy Smallmouth Freaks, his special designed um, monster mouth, because I like his better than any of the other ones that I've seen out there. Um, I like the size of the foot pedal. I like the resolution that it, it has for movement, the whole nine yards. And then I got to bring my boat to Bass Fishing Electronics, have him put in um, the Sea Clear thing, and then just redo a bunch of wiring my boat. I'm probably going to add a lithium battery and get rid of the AGM I have for my cranking because it has to power literally all of that crap on top of the other stuff I have. Um, add an aerator to my other live well. Like, I'm I'm doing this all at once because I don't want to have to worry about my boat being gone for me at any other point in the year. And just get it done. That'd be good to go. It's it's a lot. Uh, last I looked into it, it was going to cost me about $12,000. Yeah. 
to do everything I want to do. Hmm. Yep. Start donating. <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, you know what? If my job comes through the way they said they were supposed to, that's only that's like it's yeah, like I know. Easy, easy. I know. Um very easy, Cam. You can do both without a problem. The turret is you have to get a different kind of mount, uh, but TJ has one already mocked up that he can run the 360 off the same mounting plate that the turret for the live scope will be mounted to. So everybody works all hand in hand, nice and nice and comfortable. Um, all right, Jerry, that's good to know. We'll do. Thank you, man. But uh, you know what? It's 940. We covered pretty much everything. Just slow down. Throw a big heavy jig and it's, it's, drag it's it simple. slow. It's that simple. Just go find a steep bank and huck a big heavy ass jig. Good luck. Let us know how many fives you catch this weekend. Uh, give all credit to 603 Bass and really one of the Bass Talk. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good night. <laughs> See ya. Peace. Hey, that could have been a 30 second stream. Easy peasy. I'll do it an Instagram reel. Slow down. Catch giants. Heavy football heads. Oh, oh my God, dude. I have an idea. <laughs> I think I already know where this is going. <laughs> John, I think we're gonna have we're gonna have the first canoe with spot lock next year. That's awesome. Uh yes, Mary, we do fish relatively local. I'm hesitant to say where because we have some good old honey holes not too far from here, but pretty much everything we do for fishing is west. I never ever 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 go east of where we live. Like towards Nash from Manchester? Nope. The only exception I make to that when we go out that way is um, where we did our tournament this this summer, Pawtuckaway. That's a fun spot. Yeah, that place is sweet. It's just a nightmare to get in there in the summer. Yeah. yeah. The parking situation is crazy. It's wicked popular. The launch is weird. You got to idle for like a mile out to the main lake. Yeah, that's the worst part. But otherwise, yeah. Fishing's good. Everything we do for fishing is either west or north. Never, ever go east. Or sometimes south. Sometimes. Well, yeah, if we're Rarely. going south, it's usually this time of the year, right? Where it's super cold and we're going to go down to the Cape area. Pretty much. We travel. What town is that? Pretty right. much everything south of Plymouth and out onto the arm towards, you know, into Cape Cod um, is where we'll do all of our late and really early season fishing. Like, we were down there. What was, whatever the, the last weekend in February was of this year was our first weekend of fishing. And I think we did the first four weeks in Mass this year. I think so. Because we went back weeks. to that same that same pond back to back weeks, and I think we went and tried another pond. Yeah, we went down there with Goodman. Or was that last year? I don't remember. When he caught that six and a half, was that this year in the spring or last year in the fall? I think it was this year in the spring. It was in the spring. Okay, so we went down three, and I thought there was a fourth. Yeah, and then we went to the uh, the toilet. Remember there was a tournament going on? <laughs> we rolled up, we met Steve there. No, where he caught the oh, six yeah, and a half was yeah, last yeah. year, late in the season, like in December. Really? Yep. And then we went back down. Tron we was there. Yeah, yeah. That was the end of the year. It was in December. And then we came back this spring. I don't spring. freaking remember. Every, it all, it's all together. It's all in one. I, know. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. We we fished at least three weeks in, in Mass down towards the Cape to start the year. Um, But it may have been four weeks. Brian raves about how state record came out of Botanipo in Brookline, and he likes it. He is correct. It came out of Botanipo. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> um, that you know, that's actually that 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 pond is a nightmare, but it does kick out a giant here and there. Just good luck getting on it. Because I think I've caught more fives years. out of there than I've caught anywhere else. Yeah, I uh, caught quite a few out of there. A lot of fours, not that many fives, but quite a few of fives still. Um, Dan, what do I do about road salt in my boat? Well, like Wash today, it. I spent 45 minutes washing my boat. <laughs> $20 a quarter for the car wash. I'm not even joking. Oh I was there Dude, for 45 minutes. Dude, bring it to the other one. You can swipe your card. Yeah, but I got cash. I don't want to put a car wash in my credit you card. You just have $20 and quarters just on hand? I, I shit you not. Know, I have about $800 in spare change in my house. In this house? Yes. And I know that because the last time we filled, because okay. I like that, it's a habit I got into when I was delivering pizza when I was 18. Here we go. Here's a random story. Um, at the end of the night, my first shift, I realized that like I had a like 10 pounds of spare change in my pocket from all my deliveries. And some people, like as they're going in, they're like changing all their quarters and stuff for bills. And I'm like, I should just save this nigga. And like, 
every six months, I'd go and cash in like $300 and change. So I've, I've been in that habit my entire life ever since then, since I was 18. So almost 20 years now. Jesus Christ. So I, every time I come home, I have a spare change. We throw it in a jar. And then when that, like, it's a mason jar. And then you full. dump it into a big, and one of those five gallon. Not quite that big. So the, the bigger jar, the last time we cashed in just that bigger jar was 250 bucks. And you have four I times have filled that. that three times. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm gonna start doing that. I and I got that mason jar because of the the pandemic. We couldn't go to our bank, the one bank that we have, our credit union, where we can dump all the spare change, and they don't take a cut of the percentage, so you get 100 percent of it. Because I'm not giving up 20 percent of all that hard earned pocket change. Hell no. So anyway, every time I go to the car wash, I just raid the jar for a bunch of quarters. Which is why I think like. Based on how big that thing is, and that I filled three of them now, whereabouts? It'd be about like seven hundred fifty bucks, but I've taken so many quarters, probably close to six hundred. Well, if I fill the jar one more time, or another a fourth jar up there, it's probably gonna fall through the freaking floor. <laughs> Dude, they're it's heavy. probably like four hundred pounds. <laughs> it's t- Each jar is over fifty pounds. Oh my god, we're close to it. I think it's like high forties. I did weigh it one day. Ah, <laughs> uh, um, I've never been to Mass. I sorry, I've been to Mass Music twice, but I rarely go. I've been there once. It's a cool spot. Dan is diehard. Well, how high, how diehard is Dan? We were fishing in our bass boat. We started it's last an year. Moron. Dan is diehard. Time to win our eyes. <laughs> <laughs> we started our year last year. Last year, 2020, the first weekend of March. We we're out in the boat, and we stayed in my boat, fishing out of my bass boat until January 17th of this year. Had six weeks off, and we we're back in the bass boat the last weekend in February. And we've been in the boat every, every weekend since. Yep. Um, Donk Swampy, I just drain it. That's it. There's nothing else to it. You just drain, drain thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly drain the boat when you're off the water. So, um, trim it all the way down. Wait until everything is drained out. It takes a couple minutes. Tilt it all the way back up. Same deal. Wait like 30 seconds and pretty much the last of it will drain out and then store it for your trip home. That gets almost everything out. One thing I did learn, and I got to do it before we go back out this week, because I just be on the safe side. There's two things where you get water that will always freeze, pain in the butt. Close your live wells before you get to the lake. Don't let any water in there. So it's one less thing you have to worry about for water intrusion, potentially ice building up and breaking. Um, if you had to run your um, bilge pump, that hose that runs from the bilge pump up and out to the back of the boat, there that will freeze too. And then the you water bet. that runs through the outboard and pees back into the lake, that will also freeze. If you get, like, one of those primer bulbs you use for your gas tank on your boat, they're, like, the medical version of that, you get that and really, really thin surgical tube, and you would tie, like, a good stretch. It's a little siphon. Bingo. And you just shove it down in there. And you can do it for the outboard one, but it's, like, you have to use, like, a really, really thin diameter tube for the outboard hose. But, like, your bilge pump tube, you can use a pretty good-sized diameter and just, like, a couple pumps of that thing right out and... You get almost all the water out. At that point, you're like 98% empty on water from based on what I find with my boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cam, next week, Thursday, Friday. Not this week, Thursday, Friday. Next week, whatever it is. The 9th and 10th, I think. What is today? 1st, 2nd, 3rd? 10th, yes. 10th. 9th and 10th because the 11th is a work Christmas party. Yeah. Um, so Sorry. if you can make one of those days worse, Friday, next Friday, book it. Make it happen. Let's go up to Winnie. I would, I've heard that the blade bait bite up there is legendary this time of the year. I've never even bothered to go because it's a lot of water to try and cover to figure it out. And I've got other lakes at work. So let's make it happen. Mary, we have it shrink wrapped and winterized at NECC in Rochester. My my Beamer has my garage size gear. <laughs> Beamer can stay outside. It was built in Germany. They get snow there. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a garage, I would totally tell my wife one day a week. For cars to park outside. Dude, my Beamer in the snow was sick. Yeah, it's a little sled. <laughs> yeah, it was sick. Always on ref loader. If I if I only had if I had any garage I could fit my boat in, I'd still leave my boat outside the whole time, except for the day before. That like if I'm fishing on Sunday, which is the only time I fish, I'd bring it in like Saturday afternoon. That's all you need. At least one day for everything to warm up. Any potential water that's in there that is frozen gets to thaw out. Nice happy boat, all the metal in there. Like if you have a hot foot, gets to come up above freezing, and that's all you need. Even just a half day of it to get above freezing, she's a happy boat. You're good to go. 
Um, NECC is awesome, by the way. They are very, very good people. I don't know what I'm going to do for my new boat, but if I get a Skeeter, whenever that day comes, I'll probably get it from them. Do it. Kind of, I'm really partial to the Skeeter. I like it. But that Phoenix Elite really has my eye. Same with the Blazers. The new Blazers are so nice. I don't know what I'm going to do. I haven't even seen them. I don't know. We're probably like two more years away from the channel blowing up that they'll hand us something. So we'll bite our time. We'll bite our time. It's going to happen, right? <laughs> Uh-oh. Mother-in-law's dog is in jail again. Terrorist. Oh, God. <laughs> Who's Dirt. Oh, that's my sister-in-law. Oh, Heather, my oh sister yeah. Someone used to call her Dirt. <laughs> <clears throat> and then John Ross said to her one day, you smell. <laughs> She's like, I do not. He's like, oh, Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> of course he did. Ah, good old John. What All right. What the hell? We were aiming for an hour and a half. It's been an hour and 40, no, hour and 50 minutes. Yeah, 9.50. Okay. We're done. We're done. I think, could we have elaborated on some things? better probably but we also said ask us questions so if we missed anything it's on you i'm kidding <laughs> if so at this point for anybody who's gotten this far again thank you very much greatly appreciate it if there's anything that we missed that you want us to ask and you're watching the youtube section of this now where it's already gone live we're past the live stream portion of this drop it in the comments below or hit us up we'll yep you can reach out to us on any of the social media when i say us i mean me because he doesn't do any of it so <laughs> you can hit me up any which way you want and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, for those that donated tonight, Carl, you're a champ. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. It's hugely helpful for us. And uh, for everybody else that liked the stream or shared it on social media, that is also even by far the most helpful thing you could do to help us grow. So thank you very, very much. Yes, Panda. Slide into those DMs. Um, Mary, yeah, tragically, Tropic Storm brought down two huge streets on Brian's former Stratus. <gasps> Ooh. Ah, well, silver lining. Old boat gone, but he got a new boat. So yeah. that's always good. <laughs> Stratus are nice. So, um, oh, I know Carl. I definitely know that name. So, all right, sorry. We're out. Everybody have a wonderful night. Again, reach out to us on social media in any way, which way or form. If we missed anything that you want us to elaborate on, here we go. Have a great night. Andrew, sign it off. Everybody have a wonderful night. I said that 10 times. I'm going to keep saying it. Have a great night. Have a good night. See ya. Bye. <laughs> well next week we'll be here again just like all the previous weeks uh wednesdays at eight o'clock we will see you next week